Okay, so those are the questions. We'll get to them in a little bit. Everybody turn to 1 John 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of Yahweh abides forever. I just want to point out, verse 17 is the verse I chose as my verse when I first accepted the Lord. You know, you go forward and you confess and you stand before the congregation and then they say, congratulations, you're in the family. Now you have to have a special verse that's all your own. And I picked that one. It's actually quite a good one because when you consider, what did Yeshua say? I came to do the will of my Father. I, so I hope that's uh, my case as well. Um, here, Matthew Henry breaks it down like this. He says, the lust of the flesh. Now, I think there are different opinions, and if you would like to throw your hand up after I give what Matthew Hen Henry says, I am quite open to that because this is not uh, uh, exclusive definitions here. He says the lust of the flesh would have more to do with the physical pleasures, uh, gluttony, sensuality, sexuality, things uh, that gratify, satisfy that way. Uh, the lust of the eyes would be material riches. You could say bling bling is the word that comes to my mind, or, or beauty, even beauty. Um, you notice today we have a lot of this number. Woo! And then the last thing um, Ryan, um, Matthew Henry says is pride of life is he connects it with our ears. It's praise and flattery, admiration. He, call, he says wisdom, but I would think um, rising to a, a level of intelligence or understanding. I have so much more understand because I have uh, three letters behind my name. How many letters do you have? Well, if you can't save someone's life who's dying on the floor, if you can't talk to someone about what form they need to fill out and bring them to a... a salvific relationship with the creator uh, it doesn't matter how many letters you have behind your name but still keep these three in mind because this is what we're going to take this template and uh, look at it compare it with some passages of scripture with some people in the bible all right the first place we're going to go is jenny says three jenny said a lot of things but we're going to just go to three chapter three so who would like to read a long passage? A long passage. A long time ago. Here, Brand Brendan. I'm here, son. Uh, look at the elements that the deceiver used to bring the sales pitch to Hava and Adam. Go ahead, sir. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Yahweh, the Almighty, had made. And he said to the woman, as Elohim indeed said that you shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for Elohim knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like the Most High knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right. Here's what I did is I kind of broke that down a little smaller so we can look at some specific passages. And there, here is uh, that First John 2.16 uh, verse, uh, the, our template. And uh, I'm realizing this now, uh, David. Yeah, that size font is kind of small. So I think we will be going bigger from now on, especially for a 56-year-old. Anyway, uh, look at those things there. Uh, Notice the very thing, the very first thing that is called into question. 
is something that we are dealing with right today. Questioning the authority of the word. You people with your Bibles and your religion and all that stuff, what do we know about the Bible? The world is 2.15 billion years old, and you know, uh, the very first thing um, the serpent says, did he really say that? So calling into question. Um, okay, can you, because any, anybody see those elements there, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in anything? I kind of helped you out a little bit uh, by showing you some words here. Um, anybody have any ideas what might connect? Where's the sin in wanting to be smart, right? To improve oneself. Uh, and yet, uh, this is dangled out there, in, in, which is to cause her to forget the whole fact that he said, don't, don't eat of this tree. She saw that it was good for food. I mean, good for food, that's, uh, that could be lust of the eyes or the lust of the flesh. Anyway, uh, I want to point this out because here's a pattern that we have the enemy using, right? He's, he's going right against what John is telling us is the pattern. And if you think of uh, football teams, they have plans that they run, right? And, and you have teams that have um, films of other teams, and what they do is they go through and they, they look at how they play and uh, where their weaknesses are. The enemy knows our weaknesses. He's been watching the films on us, okay? But he has no new game either. So we can watch his plays, and we can be on our guard, okay? Hallelujah for that. And we have a better coach. We have films, too. Film at 11. Okay, Isaiah 14. And it will be in the day when the Lord gives you rest from harsh service in which you were enslaved, that you will take up this ta taunt against the king of Babylon and say, how the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, and I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Boom. We all know that passage. Okay. What are my three things in First John 2.16? You should have it down by now. The lust of the, the lust of the, and the, okay, let's go there. Let's look. Okay, we're going to connect it, see if we have something connecting all three of those, okay? Look that over then. This is, this is, um, ooh, what was it? Uh, they called him uh, the king of Babylon, right? Uh, the king of Babylon said these things. What do we see in here? Uh, anybody? Pride. Where where's pride? I will ascend to heaven. Yeah, that's uh, that's taking on a position that is not even within his realm of authority. I mean, he's he's presuming, and he's assertive there, beyond his call of duty, right? Remember the sons of Korah? We're just as holy as you, Moses. weren't we called? weren't we set apart? Yes, you were. Don't presume that you can take on someone else's role. Hi, my name is David Olson. You are not David Olson, right? He was called called me to that. Although he called me, I think um, my subtitle is I really like chocolate covered almonds as well. Just to know. Could be a ministry there. Anyway, uh, what else? I will sit, I will raise my throne above the stars of God or Elohim. Uh, what were the stars? Is, is it just stars or is it angels? Either way, I guess my thinking is he's seeing his position above everybody else. He's bringing in that glory. Boy, doesn't that feel good when people just love me and they go, yay, yay, you know, at the, at the rock concert or, you know, when I, I win uh, the election and I say, yes, we have done it in the next four years, I'm going to do this. And then I turn around and I, I tell you, no, this is what's best for you. I know what's best. I'm going to give you something else. Listen to me. I have all the answers. Not everyone is like that, for sure. This is showing us more of the enemy's playbook. Uh, this is a way we can 
come to know him and be prepared. All right, moving on. Oh, new question. Who are the two individuals you think of first in Scripture that have been, uh, that as having been tempted? Think of a typical person, I just gave you one there, of famous temptations. We're going to go over two because on your piece of paper it says, first example of Scripture from Scripture of a person tempted. Would it be um, Joseph, Job, Solomon? There's the Queen of Sheba. You seem to take a bath. Never mind. Um, King Saul, maybe Simon the Sorcerer, or maybe none of those. Samson, do I hear any other before the bid goes out? Hmm? Cain, Cain. I didn't think of that one. That's a good one. Yes, David. David was tempted. Walking around, yeah, he should have been out with his troops, right? And he was walking around on the Oganio deck looking out over the neighbor's house. Anything else? Okay, the winner is, turn to Genesis 37. The first person we are talking about here is, of course, Yosef Jose. What is that in uh, French? Oui, Joseph. Joseph. Okay. Oh, just for that, uh, Josiah, award Mr. Witt with the microphone. He can read for us. Would you read for us, Mr. Witt? Now, this is just the background, right? We're coming to the actual here in just a moment. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, they that stripped Joseph of the tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him, then they took him and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Thank you. You notice I'm, I've skipped a few uh, verses in there just to get um, to the storyline. Now, think about this for a minute. Here's a fellow that had ample opportunity to blame Yahweh, to turn it back and say, look here, I've been abandoned by the Heavenly Father. I've been abandoned by my family. What is there? He could now take it out and say, no holds barred, right? If temptation comes along, let her come. All right, who is next, Josiah? Josiah, you want to read that? And after time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, hold because of me. My master has no concern, concern. about uh, anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my ch uh, charge. There is no none greater th in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from the me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness, sin against Elohim? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, to be with her. Uh, does anybody recall the proverb that says, uh, it is better to live on the corner of the roof than... Yes, with a nagging spouse. Uh, you could imagine that would wear him down over time. And once again, dad's not here. Dad's rules are not here. Who sees? It could have been just that easy. And besides, Yahweh turned his back on me. What difference does it make? But what did he say? Let's look at what he says. What is his way of handling this? All right, this is your opportunity. What is his game plan? How did he, did he 
a deal with temptation. Well, he, he got out of there. He ran away. And he said, I will not sin against God and my master. It, he's still sold out, isn't he? I mean, he's in a foreign land, in a foreign house. Um, Adonai is not even a god of this uh, people. And yet, he's holding on to these principles. And he says, you know, it's, it's just not even in my, my thinking. All right, we will get, uh, we'll come back to that a bit more. Okay, here are the temptations. Here is the second one. A second example from Scripture of a person being tempted. Do you want to turn to Matthew 4? Then was Yeshua led up the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterward hungered. No way. I mean, that just kind of stands out. Like, really? Okay. I make it about 20 minutes, and I'm going, hmm, I wonder what's in the cupboard. And the tempter came and said to him, unto him, If you are the son of Yah, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yah. Thank you. Uh, now, it says, I, I, thought, I thought it was that he, he fasted 40 days and then he was tempted. But it doesn't say it that way. It says he went out there to be tested. And... How many times was he tested? Well, we know of three, but how long did he sit there in front of him, maybe day after day, picking up a nice warm piece of bread with a little bit of butter and honey on it and locusts or something? You know, think of Potiphar's wife coming after Joseph day after day after day. And what miracles has Yeshua done thus far? Right. He put together a few tables. Probably better than me. But he hasn't, he hasn't got a single follower. He hasn't done a single miracle. He hasn't preached a single message. How do we know he's the son of Yah? Of course, Hasatan is asking him this, and he's tempting him. Uh, he's giving him this opportunity. It could have been 18 days in a row is my thinking that he, he sat there and ate pizza and um, uh, out in the desert, maybe some... A banana split or something. Okay, moving on. This is from the claymation movie Miracle Maker, a really good video. Then the devil took him into the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If you are the son of Elohim, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they shall bear you up, lest haply you dash your foot against the stone. Yeshua said unto him, Again it is written, You shall not tempt Yahweh your Almighty. Okay, anybody check this out before? Look back at Psalm 91. What's the problem with the quote? What, what Hasatan said there, he said, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and he stopped right there. And then he breaks into another verse and says, And their hands shall bear you up. There's something right in here that's missing. And what is missing is to keep you in all your ways. Yeshua said, it's not my will, but yours, Lord. It's, I haven't come to do mine. I have come to lay down my life that he may pick it back up. So uh, that's not what the, uh, the devil wants us to hear. He will quote scripture at us all day long for his gain, for his purpose, right? Why is it important for us to know our game plan? He said, uh, fragments could mix you up. Even sometimes, they'll quote the whole thing, and they'll have the context correct in order to serve the purpose of their art, which is still not to give Yahweh glory, is it? But in this case, Yeshua didn't even argue with him about it. He came back with the proper understanding of what should be done here. Don't tempt Yahweh, okay? All right, who's next? Again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, All of these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Yeshua said unto him, Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship <clears throat> Yahweh your Almighty, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Now, isn't that something? At one point... 
uh, Lucifer did say the angels will take care of you when it served his purpose. And how about that? They did. They came and ministered after the testing was done, after he was victorious. Yahweh is not unfaithful. And he saw to it and ministered to him. Um, I, I think that is that's very neat. Uh, James 4, this is what I was talking to you about earlier, Mike. James 1, 4 through 6, you don't ask. Uh, you don't have because you don't ask. You don't ask, and, and when you ask, you ask amiss. But Yahweh gives grace uh, to the humble. And if I take that passage, it, if, I, if I take the, the, the verse where he says, um, well, you, you didn't ask right. Well, how am I supposed to know how to ask right? Well, Yeshua is the one that is using the word properly. He's come to do the Father's will. If we are doing the Father's will and we are using the word properly, we will be aligning ourselves with his will. And what we ask will come to pass because that's, that's how he set it up. That's how he designed it. Philippians 4, 5 through 7, as Yeshua lived and requested, let all, us also, not putting Yahweh to the test, but humbly and gratefully trusting Okay, so what did Yeshua do to come against the, the temptation? All right, so let's look at this here real quick. Here is um, Hasatan's words. Here's Yeshua's response. And then there's our passage again. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you're the son of man, what would that be? Would, which one of these three would you say? Uh thinking, yes, sir. Now, I'd say the flesh, too, because, man, does that taste good. And when your stomach is that hungry, uh, he was like us in every way and yet without sin. Uh, you are the Son of Man. Cast yourself down, for it is written. Which one would that be? I would say, wow, it could be either one of these two because he's, he's wearing the bling-bling. He's wearing the sign that says, Hi, I am the Savior of the world. You, therefore, will uh, do as I, I tell you, angels. That was not his goal in coming as the um, suffering servant, was it? And then all these kingdoms I will give you. You know, in that moment, that, that's all we see in that moment. Uh, could you imagine... C-SPAN, microphone right there, 30 microphones, and you're being seen on television by... Uh, 40 million people, you know, they're hanging on your every word. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter what... Uh, I'm not an emissary of me. I'm an emissary of him. I've come to, to give him glory that people may see him, uh, see my good works and give him glory. He who is in heaven. Okay, back to our original questiones. You ready? Where does the temptation come from? Where does it come from, folks? Just throw your hand up, shout it out. Now, is that necessarily bad? Desire to have something better or more satisfying? Yes. Yes. Again, it's satisfying, but there you go. If, it's, if that's our goal of it, that's not giving him his glory, is it? Yes. There was an old uh, song to that effect. Give me this. I want that. Bless me, Lord, I pray. Never-ending shopping list. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, here I have a passage here. I'm going to read this one to you because it's from the Amplified uh, Translation. Happy, spiritually prosperous, favored by Yah is the man who is steadfast under trial and perseveres when tempted. For when he has passed the test and has been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which the Master has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by Yah. For temptation does not originate from the Almighty, but from our own flaws. For Adonai cannot be tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away and enticed and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire, lust, and passion. Then, and this is the sobering thing here, when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin runs its course, it gives birth to death. Do not be misled, my bro beloved brothers and sisters. We are baited, we are enticed, and we're dragged away. And that thing actually gives birth. It gives birth to sin. 
and the end of sin is death. Here's another passage. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be sober, be watchful, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brethren in the world. I guess my answer in part is, where does temptation come from? Yes. Yes, I was going to say, it's a two-party thing. It, it's not enough to have a uh, soupy salesman come up and say, buy my old jalopy. You have to be a part of it too. You have to be the recipient that goes, wow, that surely looks like a great lemon. How much is it? Only $4,000. Yes, so we have to monitor those things within us. When does temptation come? When we are weak. Oh, that's good. Only when we're weak? That's good, though. <laughs> yes. And that holding the pen out at me is making the point for sure. Yeah, there's something, there's like a magnetic field that kind of draws you close when... Trouble is, though, I have something of a memory. And, and I know in that other room there's that large jar of cookies that's just calling out, Eat me, eat me. When there's a decision, a tough decision sometimes. Here are the ones I kind of, if I'm worn out, I, I'm susceptible. Why is that? Why is that? I can put on that facade at work all day long, get along with the guys, and then come home and meet my wife. Oh, what a day I had. And don't you mess with me. Don't you push my buttons. And who knows better my buttons than my wife, right? Oh. Okay, these are what I put. Uh, to add to what, what you said, both weakness and strength, um, sometimes coming off a spiritual high, like uh, the women's uh, retreat, the men's weekend, uh, coming f away from service, Monday morning. What do they call it that anyway? Celebrating a victory. And you know, <laughs> there was, I listened to one, one speaker, he was talking about, he was going... You know, and I cut the enemy down this way, and I cut him down that way, and I said, and it is written, and it is written, and I slammed the door, and I said, ha, ha, I won, I beat you, I, pride slipped in the back door. So you got to watch the back door, too. Okay, so, this is me, this is, oh, I can't stand this. Um, you know, you can have a tune jump in your head. Uh, like nothing. You can um, s uh, smell a certain scent and, and s brings back a memory. You can uh, just be walking down the road and totally unrelated and something pops in there like, I did not even invite you. I did not even go and stand in front of the cookie jar. And there it was. Go away. I have nothing to do. Then there are other times, like like Terry says, you know, my... I have a certain weakness, and I go, huh, wow, when I'm weak, I think about this. Hmm, I wonder if I'm thinking about that. I am. Ha, huh, what a coincidence. I'm thinking about that. <laughs> Hello? Okay, so the, uh, this last one I, I figured kind of covers it, and I realize my font is a little small. Generally, while you're still breathing. That's my answer. Who does temptation come to primarily? And I put this this way so that Jonathan would not say, to whom? I put the word primarily on the end, so I didn't end with the word to. But truly, it is, uh, to whom does temptation come? Primarily. I threw that word in there just to kind of cover my own tail. But really, yes. Believe, yes. Why would he mess with non-believers? And yet, any other answer? Yes. You know, the, where Paul says, even those who do not have the law, what they keep, the, the moral code within them that he placed in, is a law unto themselves. And when they know that, and they violate that very conscience, uh, cons conscience, yes, uh, they are uh, surrendering to temptation. Yes, sir. Yes. Have you ever played the game Risk? Yeah. You... you you mount up your armies in one place, and then you go across the continent, and you wipe them out. And who do you leave behind? You leave one little peon, 
one little tiny army, and then, of course, the enemy comes from the other way and then wipes you out and you start all over again. You don't have to keep, you don't have to keep barraging if the target is easy, do you? I mean, you're going to focus where you need to, and that's, hello, sir. You beat your brother in risk? He didn't tell me that for sure that he had played risk. You know, Dylan, I beat my brother one time in chess. I never let him forget that. I surprised myself. I could never do that again. Okay. Everyone, I said, but be on guard. Why? Who is it? Those new in the faith. When we think of the parable of the sower and the seed, where, where is that seed? It grows quickly and then it's choked out. Those folks, we need to try to help as we can. They have no foundation. Let's, oh, I just, what happened? So, going down your questions. Ooh, watch that water thing there. I'll take this. Ha ha, hard copy notes. The next question, where is the best place to be when temptation comes? That's an easy one, isn't it? The way, what do you mean the way? Away, oh, away. <laughs> Well, on that note, let me tell you a short parable, an African story. Uh, there was a man, and he was told that death was in the next village, and it was coming to visit him the next day. He said, I'm going to beat death. I'm going to be over in that village, and he'll never find me. Well, uh, later the next day, when he was at that village, his wife ran into death in the marketplace, and she said, ha! You missed my husband. Oh, no, I've got an appointment with him in that village later this afternoon. So it's not like we're going to be able to run away from complete temptation. I see what you're saying. We want to, run, we, we want to remove uh, temptation as possible. But sometimes it's there. Those being effective for the kingdom. Let me go back to this real quick, because I think this is rather important. To whom does temptation come? Those being effective for the kingdom. So if you're not being tempted, there's one of two things wrong, possibly. You're not aware of it, and that's not a good thing. Or you're not being effective, and that's not a good thing. All right? Something to think about. The best place to be? In the will. I thought for sure you were all going to tell me that right off the t Larry was thinking, and I can see, but he just didn't. He was too humble. Okay, so... There are some passages that talk about what we should be busy about in the midst of our daily living. Consider Balaam on the mountainside, right? He is hired by Balak, or empty, empty head, to curse these people. What are they doing about Balak up there on the, on the mountainside? Nothing. They're probably not even aware. So what are they doing? They're going about their daily lives. And what's in the middle of the camp? The tabernacle. And what's over the, the tabernacle? The presence. So people are coming out of their tents. They're singing the Shema. They're going to tabernacle and doing their offerings, doing their prayers, blessing their neighbor. What can, what can Balaam do? Not a thing. Because they're doing the will. They're living in it. The two greatest commandments. Well, I don't know the will. Well... Love Yahweh with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, that. Yes, that. Micah 6, 8. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Now, this is just a few verses, right? But you know these. Be, uh, be wise, filled with the Spirit. Give thanks, submitting to each other. Oh, that love your neighbor thing again. Present yourselves as living sacrifice. Be transformed in order to prove. Oh, I wrote that twice, didn't I? what is good, acceptable, and perfect will. The, oh, the perfect will. How about that? But I don't know his will for my life. Well, I'll start with Psalm 34, 13. Keep your tongue from evil. Oh, well, that was going to take me a lifetime. Get started. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. Oh, my wife gets me on that one all the time. Honey, can we watch this movie? Honey, it's got the... Yeah. Well, it, well, yes, but it's not as bad as, oh, okay, let's watch something else. Fine. Master the 66 books. He's given you 66 books of prophecy. Master those first, and then we can talk about uh, what more specifically he, he has for you to do. Okay? 
What is the primary weapon to use to resist temptation? Oh, we have, we have two answers. Very good. Very good. So let's argue these out. Is it prayer or is it the word? Oh, oh man, Gladys, you're on the D money. The, now, where's Tim? Why can't I point out to Tim? Mary Emma, you'll have to tell Tim, why can't he be like my favorite student, Gladys? Okay. Well, anyway, I put the word. But here's the point. Uh, Psalm 119, 105. Uh, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my... Okay. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the... Okay. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And what knowledge? Not necessarily um, electricity or static electricity, but it, the truth shall set you free. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. I guess I should back up here. Yeah, that was it. Okay, so, yes, every time he comes back with Scripture, doesn't he? He's the living, uh, the living word. Oh, yes. He didn't go and pray, did he? But he was in the constant. Yes. I hope I don't have to pray 40 days before I meet my first temptation in order to overcome it. Take a lifetime and walk through the garden of the word in the cool of the day with your Savior. Overcoming. Here we go. All right, now you have on the bottom of your sheet seven keys to overcoming. David, seven keys. And if you write today, if you call today, I'll throw in the Ginsu knife. Forget the Ginsu knife. Let's just go through the seven. Train every day for the battle. Okay? Philippians 4. Finally, brethren, we used to do this as kids. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report, think, think, think on these things, okay? That's the first thing. What's the second one? Any idea? Any question? Any guesses? Of course, you're going to say establish boundaries. This is kind of funny. We poke fun or we throw rocks at, at our brother Judah because he puts up fences around the Torah. And then, and then he's got fences around fences. And then before you know it, he's got little gardens, and he's completely forgotten about the Torah because he's got a nice fenced-in lawn here. No, no, no. I, I listened to a fellow, and he said, you move the line back. And I thought, what's the line? Well, he put a strip of tape out here, and then he said, if that's the line between me and sin, I'm going to put a line over here. <laughs> I thought to myself, sounds like a fence. <laughs> it's just a little shorter. Okay, so, but the whole idea is, why should I want to live right there? Oh, because my flesh does. My flesh wants to sit with my fingers on the edge of the counter, just looking at the jar of cookies. They might move. And I want to keep count so that in case someone else comes along, they don't also see the cookies because I'm watching them. Okay, so the idea there is you don't put yourself in harm's way. You move yourself out of the situation. And if you can't move out, you move back. Okay? And uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, let's look at this. You're going to love this. Can you all see that there? That's sort of a picture of a fenced-in walking bridge in the mountains. Glorious view. But honestly, there's enough room in the middle here. I don't need the fence to walk from here to there. What is the purpose of the fence? It, it's just legalism. You're right. There are high winds. There are silly people that go squirrel. And, and then, they're, then they're singing the alpine, right? You're like, oh. Okay, so that's not good. That's why there's a fence. And caution tape. We, put, we don't put caution tape right on the edge. <laughs> because people are walking by, you know, in New York City, and they, you know, if you put the caution tape right beside the hole, um, then you you have less people in New York City. And then the last thing, do you all remember? Of course you don't. You're not as old as me, but there was a lady by the name of Nancy Reagan. She had a campaign against drugs. Now we don't have campaigns against drugs anymore. We make them recreational. But the whole point still is. Uh, the principle works. Just say no. When Hasatan says, don't you want to? You say no. Uh, with Joseph, I say, 
He has put me in charge of everything except you. You are off limits. I'm going about my work. I'm going to put up a fence. I'm going to put up uh, caution tape, and I'm going to say no. Number three, flood it or remove it. Flood it or remove it. <laughs> now, if you, has anybody ever been out to Triana Farms? That's the civil's place. But it's, the farms is the 40 million acres out back. And if you walk out to the back of those 40 million acres, there's a wooded kingdom. And right on the edge of that wooded kingdom, there's a small building for, because you can't make it back to the house before you got to go, you use this little building, right? Well, in this building, it can get a little stiff for the atmosphere in there. But Mr. Sibbles has created an, an amazing thing. He put little vents around the top so that air can flow out and you can stay dry in the, in the elements, right? So that would be the business of uh, removing, allowing it to remove. What about flooding? Anybody ever see those little things you hang that have kind of a sweet smell or a nice smell? Okay, uh, I put it this way. If when temptation comes along, if you fill your heart, your mind, your life, your preoccupation with other things so thick, the voice of, of uh, temptation becomes so low you can't hear it or it's not even clear. Is somebody saying something? I don't know. I'm in the, bill, in the middle of praising Yahweh because he has forgiven me and loved, loved me and loving me. Uh, or I can take and I can flush that thing out. He's enjoying that. Take your life and fill it with good things. That's what, um, when, when you remove something that you've loved so dearly, you've got to fill that hole, fill that gap back up. Okay? Number four. Be filled with the Ruach. Okay, now, look at my pictures. Tell me who would like to be filled with the Spirit like this. Isn't that nice? What do you think, Brendan? Is it good? Oh, a little more. Who would like to be filled with the Spirit like this? Yeah. But notice, the speaker has left a gigantic space here. It almost seems like it's intentional. Perhaps he will ask the question one more time. Who would like to be filled with the Spirit like this? So that you are filled with the Spirit such that any time the Spirit moves, you're moving because you can't control it. Yes, I want him to fill me, but I want me to flow in, in his time and way, right? Oh, it, it doesn't have to be sudsy like that, but just the whole idea that I'm in his current, right? Oh, oh, to be there, to be there. Number five, get help. I've got a friend. Her name is Mrs. Manuel. She would tell you right there, yes, everybody it's not strange to need help. Everybody needs um, accountability partner, a group therapy, a one-on-one -on -one something. This picture, to me, says it all. This person's having problems, and this person helps put it back in the right perspective. Isn't that, isn't that a great thing? And so when we're tempted, how do we overcome it? You know, we live quite a ways from each other. But there are ways, thanks to technology today, sometimes when it works, and there, there's prayer. Like the, this ladies' prayer group, my wife tells me, that Kimberly, she's on there a lot. Man, she's, she's a warrior. I don't know how you sleep at night. The lady probably is praying. Anyway, okay. So, as Ma Bell used to say, reach out and touch someone. Contemplate the worst-case scenario. I work for a company that services city water wells, okay? And when we give someone a quote, we don't tell them, oh, it's going to be 50 bucks. We'll come out and we'll fix everything. And then when we get there, we go, wow, you got some real problems there. That's going to be $45,000. No, we give them the worst case scenario up front. Your well is 200 feet deep. It's 18 inches in diameter. Your pump in there is a 12-inch pump. The... The pipe goes down so far to replace just the bowls on that pump 
is going to cost this much money. It's going to take a day for a crew of two and a crane to pull it out, bring it back to our shop, change parts, clean the well with acid or explosives or something, and bring the pump back, put it back in. That's going to take some money. And it, it, that kind of money does not grow on trees. But by saying that up front, we're telling them, oh, wow, this is going to be... And, and then they're not shocked, they're not misled, and they're not hurt, right? So how do we overcome? We give ourselves the worst-case scenario. Let me give you the worst-case scenario. There's a country song. I don't, I don't even know the name of it, but... This man, he was married, had children. I don't know what happened. In the, I don't even remember the whole storyline, but now he works at McDonald's because the divorce court took everything. And now who's coming through the drive through But the man now driving his truck, having his wife and his kids in the back seat, and he's got to ask the question, would you like fries with that? That's the worst-case scenario right there. That's a great example. So if you don't want to have that scenario, you think about that ahead of time. You don't play with matches in the middle of uh, the forest of the National Forest, right? Because we know what happens. This is from Proverbs 5. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion your and my, your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. Remember that picture of the used car salesman right at the front? And her mouth is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her step, steps lay hold of hell. Okay, remove your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honors to others, your years to the cruel one, lest aliens be filled with your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed and you say, man, I hated in instruction and my head despised, my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. There's so much more in uh, Psalm, uh, Proverbs 5 and 6. But the other passage is Luke 11. You, we all know that one. Where an evil spirit leaves, he goes to a dry place, and he says, hmm, I think I should go back to my house, house being the individual. And he finds the place clean and, and uh, swept, and he brings in seven more worse than him, and now the person's in a worse state. So when that spirit is gone, what do we do? We clean house and we build the wall. We fill it with good things, right? So there ain't no coming back with seven anything, all right? Here's the next one. Don't use your disappointments to justify your disobedience. Because he hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You know what? I... I'm going to, uh, my boss just fired me. My, my dog just ran away and said, I'm going to take your truck and your guitar and, and see you have a good life. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to do something mean to someone else. No, that, that's not justified. Okay, so when, when our brothers throw us in a pit and then they haul us out and we're shipped off to Egypt, the thing we don't do is say, I'm going to get back at you, Yahweh. What we do is we say like Job, the Lord takes, the Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be his name. I will trust in him. James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will. Revelation three twenty one. to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father and his throne. I mean, uh, how beautiful, how beautiful. It's, life is not without temptation, struggles. And, and sometimes we're going through things that we really don't like and we are, we're really struggling. And we say, why? This is not helping me. But it, 
it's, I'll close with this. It's amazing that the, the title uh, is better afterwards. How are you doing? Oh, man, this is the worst time in my life. Hey, you remember that? You know, back then? Oh, you know what? I can't believe that, but that was actually the best thing that could have happened to me. It's hard to say that in the moment. But if we can trust him, if we can follow those principles, we will overcome. May we overcome. Abba, Father, blessed be your name. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for Yeshua who loves us so that demonstrated your love for us. And I just thank you once again for worship today that just, that you're rooting for us. You're wanting us to sing. You're our biggest fan club. And you've given us the tools we need in order to uh, survive and thrive and overcome. Bless our families with small children. Bless our elderly members. Bless those who are struggling with financial and with direction and purpose. Bless and fortify those who are facing ridicule. We are your people, we are broken, and we are in need, and it's by these things that you bring us together and we strengthen each other, and we say, as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. We love you and praise you in Yeshua's name.